Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Imagine this. You're an NFL quarterback and you're playing the best football of your entire career. You finished the season winning just about every accolade in the book. Pro Bowl appearance? It's yours. First Team All-Pro nomination? It's yours. Heck, even the MVP of the league, all of it is yours. You're in the prime of your career. You're the best that the game has to offer right now. And yet, after winning the MVP, you decide to retire. Not because the team did something to you or spited you, or not because the commissioner was going to suspend you, but rather, just because you felt like it and wanted to go into a completely separate business venture. It'd be tough to imagine Lamar Jackson just retiring right after the 2019 season, or Patrick Mahomes retiring right after 2018 ended. But as crazy as this might sound, back in 1969, this actually happened. Baltimore Colts quarterback Earl Morrill was coming off of his improbable 1968 campaign where he guided the Colts to the Super Bowl. And then, roughly six months later, he announced his retirement from the game. This is the crazy story behind the time that Earl Morrill retired, to the shock of just about everybody. Before I talk about the retirement, we need some context to understand how we got to this point, and to understand just who Earl Morrill is. For the first decade of his career, if there was any phrase to describe Morrill, it would probably be career journeyman. He got drafted second overall by the San Francisco 49ers in 1956. By 1957, he was playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and he made the Pro Bowl in Pittsburgh after finishing fourth in the league in touchdown passes and going 6-5 across his 11 starts. And by 1958, he found his way on the Detroit Lions, as he was part of that infamous Bobby Lane trade. From 1958-64, to 64, Morrill would play in Detroit, and while he wasn't spectacular by any means, primarily serving as the backup for guys like Tobin Rote, Milt Plum, and my personal favorite, Jim Nanowski, who was somehow starting the bulk in the 1960 season despite throwing two touchdowns and 18 interceptions, Morrill definitely had his moments. In 1963, he threw 24 touchdown passes, ranking fourth in the league, and he had the fourth best passer rating in football to go along with it. He threw the game-winning fourth quarter touchdown pass in a December game against the Colts in 1962, which kept Detroit alive in the Western Conference alongside the Green Bay Packers. This was a theme throughout Morrill's career, but it really started in Detroit as he was all you could want at a backup quarterback, and more. However, in 1965, he was traded to the New York Giants. And while things went well in 1965, as he finished third in the league in touchdown passes with 22, by 1966, things had gone off the rails a bit. He was on the wrong side of 30, and got the brunt of the blame as the Giants went 1-5-1 in his seven starts. His passer rating of 54.1 was a significant decline from what it was in 1965, when it was 86.3. The fans were booing him and rooting for him to get pulled for the youngster Gary Wood. Eventually, Morrill would get benched, and he wouldn't start a single game for New York in 1967. Before the 1968 season began, he was shipped off to the Baltimore Colts to be the backup to the legendary Johnny Unitas. Little did he know that his entire career and his entire legacy was about to change forever. During the final preseason game, which was a contest against the Dallas Cowboys, Johnny Unitas got injured. Something was wrong in his elbow, and while no one knew how serious it would be, as status updates seemed to be given on a weekly basis, this meant that Morrill was now going to be starting games under center for the Colts. The longtime backup quarterback was thrust into action. And because of it, NFL history changed forever. It's either this or Kurt Warner in 1999 for the best season-long performance by a backup quarterback off the bench. But if you want to go with Morrill for what he did in 1968, I've got absolutely no complaints. He made the Pro Bowl. He was named a first-team All-Pro. He threw a career-high 26 touchdown passes, which led the entire NFL. He was averaging over 9 yards per pass attempt, which is absurd. For some perspective on how crazy that is, second place was a tie between Cowboys quarterback Don Meredith and Browns quarterback Bill Nelson. Both of those guys averaged 8.1 yards per attempt. Morrill was averaging more than a full yard per attempt more than the next best quarterback in the league. He threw for 2,909 yards, which was second behind John Brody only 100 yards behind. If the Colts didn't run the ball at the end of games because they had the lead, Morrill easily could have won this award too. And it goes without saying, but the Baltimore Colts were really good in 1968. They went 13-1, and Morrill was a big reason why, as the offense was averaging over 28 points per game, which was second in the league. Some of the performances during this run were absurd. Across all 14 regular season games, he had a passer rating above 73 in 13 of them. This was at a time where the league average was somewhere around 68. Morrill played well above the league average in just about every game. Against the Bears team that the previous week held Vikings quarterback Joe Cap to 78 yards passing and a 9.7 passer rating, Morrill threw four touchdown passes. 
There's a reason why the Colts, prior to Super Bowl III, were being considered one of the greatest teams of all time, and Morrill was a big reason for it. With the exception of the Super Bowl, which was obviously won by the Jets, Morrill seemed to be on top of the world. He was a winner. He was an NFL champion. He was an MVP. He led the league in just about every passing category. His stock was at an all-time high. And yet, that offseason, he shocked everyone by walking away from it all and announcing his retirement. We have to ask ourselves the obvious question. Why the heck did Earl Morrill leave immediately after winning the MVP? That offseason, Joe Namath announced his retirement, and while that was shocking, at least there was a clear-cut catalyst for it, as Pete Rozell forced him to sell his nightclub due to shady activity or risk being suspended. You can learn more about that incident by clicking the card in the upper right corner. At least Namath's decision, even though it was short-lived, came out of something. This decision, on the other hand, didn't come out of anything that the Colts did or that the NFL did or that Commissioner Roselle did. Instead, it came out of a brand new company called Transnational Communications. The company was founded one year prior in 1968, and the idea behind the company was simple. Get former professional athletes to sell people on an investment group. And early on, this idea seemed to be working. Less than 12 months after the company's creation, they had already bought the Oakland Seals of the NHL and the Boston Celtics of the NBA. Morrill saw this as an opportunity, as he was thinking about life in the offseason and post-retirement. Remember, Morrill was 34 years old when he won the MVP in 1968. Unless your name was George Blanda, you weren't playing past your mid-30s back then. Just to make it to your mid-30s was remarkable. Morrill talked with Colts representatives about doing this in the 1969 offseason and working in the Detroit branch, and the Colts agreed. The only problem? Morrill was doing too good of a job at this company. He was doing so well, in fact, that Ellis E. Erdman, the chairman of the board, made him one of the vice presidents of the company. And not only was he named this, but he was also going to be made the president of Earl Morrill Associates, which was a subsidiary of TNC. And with that, to the shock of everyone on the Colts, Morrill decided to hang it up. Erdman wanted him at the company full-time, and Morrill said that this job with TNC was exactly what he had been looking for all these years. While he hadn't announced anything official yet, Morrill said that he was flying to set up his new office, which pretty much tells you everything that you need to know. All indications were that he was retiring, and choosing this agency over football immediately after winning the MVP. The money was good, he was getting up there in age, this seemed like a perfect post-retirement job, and remember that even if Morrill came back to the Colts, he wouldn't even be guaranteed the starting job, as Johnny Unitas wasn't going anywhere. Morrill hung it up. And then, he changed his mind. We have no idea what exactly changed between Morrill, TNC, and the Colts. There was no documentation anywhere that I could find about why Morrill, after leaning toward the TNC job, was now going to be playing football after all. However, he did say in an earlier press release that his communication with the Colts would be the deciding factor. So obviously, Colts personnel said something really good to him. Because when training camp opened up, Morrill was there. He wasn't going to be retiring after all. The hysterical part is that Morrill's playing career lasted longer than TNC did. Without getting into too many specifics, TNC was kind of a mess. They routinely missed payments with their professional sporting teams. Their ownership of the Boston Celtics was notoriously terrible. The company defaulted in 1971, and filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 1972. Meanwhile, in 1972, Morrill was on the Miami Dolphins, filling in for the injured Bob Greasy, leading the league in passer rating, being named the first team All-Pro and the Comeback Player of the Year by the Pro Football Writers Association, and guiding Miami to its first Super Bowl title in franchise history and an undefeated 17-0 season. Morrill would play in the NFL all the way until 1976, when at the age of 42, he finally hung it up for good. Everyone, including Morrill himself, thought his career was over. And then he lasted a decade longer in the league. And it's crazy to think of Morrill's legacy. He's the greatest backup quarterback in the history of the NFL. He sold that title for nearly half a century, and he's probably going to continue to hold on to that title for the rest of NFL history. He was never really the starter, but practically every time he came off the bench and had to fill in, he performed his job like one of the best quarterbacks in the league. That legacy was cemented after that 1972 season in Miami. But if Morrill took that full-time job with TNC in 1969, just like all indications said he would, then his legacy would be completely different. Because if he took that job, he'd be known forever as the guy who won the MVP, and then out of nowhere, suddenly retired. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Monday and Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jrgator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. 
To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping with the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.